Happy Sunday morning, everybody. Welcome to another View Q, where I answer all the best viewer questions from the View Q two weeks ago. And today we're going to be talking about my RV driving lessons, who that guy was at the end of my last video, and naked guys, privacy, and how to find friends on the road, why fifth wheels are more expensive, and more. Good morning, bird watchers. I'm gonna go ahead and call you that because some funny person in the last view queue said that he guesses he's a bird watcher because I told you guys my nickname with my family is Bird and I thought that was funny. And before we get started, I want to say thank you to all the wonderful comments on the last view queue um, about the TED Talk. I guess a lot of you had not seen it and saw it and I really appreciate all the support and also all the people that have gone in and reviewed my last book, Work From Home While You Roam. So um, thank you for that, and I'm gonna get right into your questions. Oh, okay, so I put out a video on Wednesday with these amazing lights that I put at the top of my slides. They'll change colors um, to any color you want, and they give this great ambient light, but they also work as a light show to sound if you want it to. And at the end of that video, there was a guy that was like, have happy travels and be free. Happy travels and be free. <laughs> now, a lot of you were like, is that your dad? Is that Doug? Who's that guy? That guy is my friend Badge, who has a channel that I'm going to link for you down below because it leads into the next most common question I got, which is how did you get RV driving lessons? You guys, I'm seeing myself in the camera here and I have to tell you, um, I'm having power issues today, not the fifth wheel, it's me. So um, this, my hair dried naturally. <laughs> and then I went to open up an overhead cabinet, people on the road, you know what I'm talking about. And a big document fell across my face and gave me a giant paper cut right here. I, you probably can't see it, thank God. I'll tell you, when you live in an RV, you just get hurt. Like I have some cut down this finger that I don't even know how I did it. It's like I was in a knife fight or something. So, enough about me and how I look today. Danelle Downer asked me where I got lessons and so did a bunch of other people. You guys, it has been an odyssey <laughs> trying to get lessons. As you know, I bought my fifth wheel, never test drove it because I didn't have a truck. I had it delivered to my campground and I was looking into places to get lessons once I had the truck with the hitch put in. So for anybody else who wants to know, Escapees has lessons and the Family Motor Coach Association, FMCA.com has lessons or you can go to RVSchool.com and they will help you find a local instructor in your area. Now, I was gonna do that, but then the guy that delivered my RV did such a great job and it was super icy that I asked him if he would be willing to give me lessons. He was great, he worked at the dealership, he said he would. The problem is that I was in Colorado and every single weekend that we had scheduled for him to teach me, it was like a blizzard. <laughs> in fact, the last day he was supposed to come and teach me, I had a foot of snow. So luckily my friend Badge that you saw at the end of that video has been giving me lessons and I'm going to show you all of it. Although, here's a sneak peek. You guys, I love it. Robert finally driving the truck. He's going 74 miles an hour. 74 miles an hour. You're gonna get picked up by the FUD and thrown in jail. I is love this, it. Uh, is this better than your motorhome? Yeah. I'm gonna tell you guys all about it. I'm still taking lessons, hooking up, unhooking, and backing into different kinds of spaces. I'm gonna bring you guys along while I do all of that, but I'll tell you this right now. I love driving this fifth wheel. I love it, I love it on the truck. It is a completely different experience than I had with my Class C. God, it is bad, isn't it? Now that I have my glasses on, because you guys know I'm blind. Janine Ivy asked, is insurance more costly for a fifth wheel versus a B or a C? Well, it's not that the insurance on the fifth wheel itself is more expensive. It's that you have to pay double insurance. So this is something I took into consideration when I switched to this rig, but you have to get insurance and registration for the fifth wheel and the rig. So basically it doubles the cost. I knew that that was gonna happen. If you're in a state where you don't have sales tax or the registration cost is lower, that's gonna help. There are some insurance companies that will let you add on 
the fifth wheel or a trailer onto your auto policy, but it doesn't cover everything I wanted it to cover. So do your research. I have a video, I don't know, about a year ago called Insurance 101. There's also stuff in the Be a Nomad book about this if you need information. But for me to get the coverage I wanted, I needed to get two different insurance policies and two different registrations. So that along with the gas mileage, I think I'm spending about $200 more a month. But to me, it was worth it because now I have a truck. I can get around more easily. I don't have to break camp to go and get things. In my Mercedes Sprinter, with a 25-foot Class C, my gas mileage was 15.6 miles to the gallon on average diesel. And if I haul my fifth wheel with full tanks, I'm getting about nine. But like I said before, I camp more than I drive. If anyone wants to move to a trailer or a fifth wheel, that is a different kind of expense you have to work out for the insurance and registration and maybe the gas mileage. Okay, Frequent Flyover said, now that you have hundreds of videos out, which one is your favorite? That, no one's ever asked me that. You know, initially I think of my favorite videos that I think you guys can use like the one on insurance or how to get health insurance or how to find a job on the road, that kind of thing. The kind of stuff that I never found when I was watching YouTube before I hit the road. But for me personally, I have to tell you, my favorite is the Road to 100,000 What You Didn't See, which I put out when I hit 100,000 subscribers. And actually not that many people watched it, respectively even though it took me three months to edit. I think it was because it said thank you subscribers on the thumbnail and people didn't know what was in it, but it really showed my actual life. And I have to tell you, um, it was a lot of work to do that video, but when it was done, I couldn't stop watching it. I watched it over and over and over because I went, wow, I did that. I really did that. I've been all these places. I've done all these things. It's like all the behind the scenes stuff that I don't show because I don't do a lot of travel stuff. And I really liked it. My second runner up for my favorite, would have to be Carol and Robin go to Mexico, <laughs> which I did last year with my friend Carol. I will link both of those down below if you guys want to check them out. They're just fun, and they're the ones that I want to go back and watch, you know, if I need a laugh. Jay Diaz asked, a while back you were going to post about the perfect Wi-Fi setup you were testing out from a couple you had met. Did you transfer this over to the new rig? Will there be a video? Okay, so yes. Now, you guys know I interviewed a couple that was in a B, and they were tech people and had the best Wi-Fi setup I've ever seen. So I got part of their setup, but then I wanted to get an antenna that would work with that setup. But because I knew I was switching rigs, I didn't want to install that antenna. So you guys, next week I am getting a boatload of solar put on this. Um, that's the power. <laughs> because I don't, I don't really have any power right now. But the same time I do that solar, the people that are doing it are going to put up the Wi-Fi antenna so that the cords go down the same area because I didn't want to do it before they did it because I didn't want to mess up their footprint for the solar and I don't want anyone walking on the solar to do it when they're done. After the antenna's up, I'm going to put the other components with it and test it for you guys so you can see a video coming out on that soon. I have a way that I can get three different carriers. You guys are asking the nicest questions today. Jack Parker said, I've always seen you as a focused woman who works hard and fearlessly goes after what she wants. But on the travel side, what is it that motivates and excites you? What kind of locations and experiences do you aim for? Oh, good one, Jack. Um, I'm working on this. Like I said in my TED Talk, it's about time. And I feel this real pressure about how much time we have and how much I wanna get done in my life. And that has made me work a little bit too hard, like I said in the TED Talk. But I'm working on that. And what motivated me last year, this time pressure, is not what I want to motivate me this year. This year, I really want to enjoy my friends and family, and my travels. So personally, I like to go out to remote areas where every day I have like a morning campfire. And I'm telling you, you guys, even when I'm super busy, to go out in the morning and plant both of my feet flat on the ground, and I do this on purpose, and just take a breath 
There's something about that that is so grounding and no matter what else is going on, I look for that. I look for that and um, I have to tell you, everybody complains about travel day. You know, when you have to break camp and travel because it takes a lot more time than you think it's going to. And sometimes it can be a hassle, but I'll tell you, I love travel day. I um, get really excited once everything's done and packed up. You know, the packing up and dumping the tanks and all that stuff is not fun. But once I'm on the road and I put my road trip play mix on and I just settle back, you know, especially the fifth wheel, y'all. It's like watching the road go by and seeing how people live, the sun and the seasons. That is what I really, really love. And I get excited to see new places. I get excited to travel. No matter what kind of a day I'm having, if I go into a new town, I think it's super fun and I get excited about that. So this year, I'm motivated to relax a little bit more, spend time with the people I love, and I just want to enjoy my travels. You know, I've spent a lot of time figuring out the best way to do it for me. Now I want to do it. So thank you. That was a great question. Ooh, this is an important one, you guys. So Leon Newton asked me, I have a question about the new Real ID compliant driver's license that is required to fly, even domestic, starting October 2020. You will need two documents that prove your residency. Is this a problem for full-timers? Okay, I did something on my blog about this in a video last year because I thought it was so important for nomads to get a jump on this, but I'm telling you, Leanne, I just went through this and it wasn't the residency that jammed me up. So let me explain. First of all, it's important to say that I've, I've seen people mention, even on your question, that some nomads think that the Real ID Act is trying to get people to stop traveling. So just let me go back a minute. This is just a cluster that was started after 9-11 um, because of how those terrorists were able to get driver's licenses. The act requires states to get people to prove residency so that they can get a driver's license that has a little star on it. And without that, you can't fly with it. Now, you can still fly with a passport. So some states don't want to play in this. And um, I just changed my state residency. And my last state was not a real ID state, so I had to prove it again in my new state. You can prove your local residency in all kinds of ways. Like, let's say you're in Arizona. Lots of mailbox services will do that for you. Escapees will do that for you. They give you a Texas address. Just remember that you're going to have to have your insurance, your registration, your voter registration, all of that stuff in that state. You don't really want to split it. I do talk a lot about that and be a nomad, change your life and explain why that is. But I didn't have trouble proving my residency. What I had trouble with was proving my social security number. And you guys, I had to go seven times to the DMV. Now, it's because one place wouldn't transfer states and there were other problems, but they gave me the list of what they needed I had all my stuff. And here was my problem. I didn't have a social security card. My problem was that you have to prove your social using like a 1099 or a W-2 or a pay stub. And because I'm self-employed, I have 1099s and I have not had a 1099 since 2008 that didn't have all but the last four of my social security number blocked out. It's not like one of those things maybe where you can just run through town and get it if you don't have it. Like I said, I had to go seven times. Based on the lines that I had to sit through, even now, not even close to October, believe me, go get it done now. Okay, I love your names. Queen High Heels said, privacy. Is privacy an issue for you? Do you feel that you have more or less privacy in an RV? RV walls are so thin. Where you park has a lot to do with privacy, right? How would you advise someone, like myself, who's going from sticks and bricks to freedom? and who appreciates privacy. Not constant privacy, of course, but how is RV life different in this regard? Okay, well, here's the thing. It's a mixed bag because if you're a boondocker like me, it's very private. I mean, you're out in the middle of nowhere, not another soul, which some people like or don't like. So from that perspective, there's more privacy. But I'll tell you this, the walls are thin, girl. And if you're gonna be with a partner, Forget about having any like bathroom privacy because 
everybody can hear everything when you're in an RV. The walls are thin. And even if you're camping somewhere next to somebody, <laughs> actually, I have to tell you, one time I was camped in this overflow parking lot at Turquoise Lake in Leadville, Colorado. Oh, you guys, so great. It's an overflow lot, so nobody was there, and it was right on the lake. And late at night, I started to hear all these cars come in. It was fall, and I was on a lake, and it was cold. So without the window even being open, they all poured in. There was like a, the party apparently was right next to my RV. It got to be 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. They were just partying right there. Dogs barking, laughing, people pounding on stuff right outside my window. Well, of course, I peeked out for a minute, like hours before. And I thought, you know, keep it in your pants, Barrett. It's one night. They're just having a good time, right? But about 1 o'clock in the morning their door was open and it started to beep and nobody cared apparently they just kept laughing and whatever so just laying on my back no window open i go your door's open and everybody went dead silent like where did that come from where did that come from and then you hear the door shut and i go there you go <laughs> so yes the walls are thin you can hear people that are parked right next to you and oh here's another good one I've never had a problem on BLM land with any kind of crime or vagrant or, you know, sketchy people or anything like that. But one time I was in Buena Vista and I like to go outside like at one o'clock in the morning with no lights and just look at the stars. And no, I'm not scared to do that. If I can see them, they can see me. So I'm out there, right? There must have been another RV so far away I couldn't even see it. But all of a sudden, this couple gets into a huge fight. I could hear them fighting inside their RV. And I was like, oh, shit, somebody's not getting along over there. And then you hear this door slam. And this guy go, bam, 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 bam. Open the effing door. Bam, 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 bam. And I was like, oh, crap, she locked him out. And I could hear the whole fight um, because walls are thin. <laughs> and finally, you guys, about privacy, you got to know that when dusk comes, even if you have like that tinted kind of window on your RV, people can see in, especially if you have a light on inside and it's darker outside than it is inside, they can see you, they can see everything you're doing. One time I was in Moab and every night at dusk, I would take a walk around this loop. And every time I walked by this class B this guy was in, you know, I glance over and he was butt naked inside of the RV, like just standing in the hallway. And I was like, oh God, oh, sorry, dude. Like, I didn't mean to catch him. He must not have realized that people could still see him. But then the next night happened again. And by this time I'm trying not even to look, you know, <laughs> but it's like a train wreck, you can't help it. And by the third night, I was like, I think he knows. <laughs> I think he knows and that's just how he rolls. So, naked guys, yeah, that's, um, that's a reason to camp away from people. Now, he never was, like, naked outside. Maybe he just liked to be naked in his own house at night. Cool, man. You know, do your thing. But just know everybody can see you. <laughs> I think he liked it. That's all I'm going to say. Privacy. Everybody's got a different take on that, right? Okay, this is my last question from Lila. She's been on the road since November 1st. And has been traveling ever since. So what is that? Probably three or four months, right? She said, I'd like to stay on the road, but she wants to know how to make friends. She says, I'd like to maybe caravan a little or have people I can meet at different places. Okay, this is a common question. And in my first book, I give you a bunch of resources with links. But just off the top of my head, I will tell you that Escapees, which I mentioned earlier with the mailing service, has kind of a younger skewed social group called Escapers, I think, or Escape X. It's something like that. And they actually meet and do stuff. Then there's a group called RVing Women that I've highlighted before. You join a local chapter in some area, but then you can join up with their meetings, which happen usually quarterly, all over the country. And a lot of those women do that, and then they make friends they travel with some of the time or all of the time. Also... I met a bunch of my current friends at the RTR, 
just camping next to them. The RTR, by the way, if you don't know, is the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous. I think it's going on right now. We're just finished. It happens every January. The Rubber Tramp Rendezvous or Cheap RV Living also has caravans. I've heard that's a great way to meet people. And also, I'll just say it depends on your style of camping. If you are a boondocker, some people are hungry to talk to other people. The best way to know is when you go through Wave. Actually, I have to tell you guys, if you ask Doug, my boyfriend, his favorite thing about camping, and he's a city guy, he loves that when you drive through a campground, people wave. That tells you everything you need to know about Doug. He's just a gem. But some people want to talk to you, and some people are in their rigs with a tinfoil hat thinking, you know, you're an alien with a human skin on. Just the truth, people. Um, everybody is going to be different out here. It's a community like any other community. So you can't just go up and knock on people's doors. This is my opinion, because you just don't know. But wave. They wave back. You know, you see them out at the campfire. They might invite you over. If you're a boondocker, it is harder to meet people. You have to do something like a meetup or a caravan, usually. Unless you go to like a long-term visitor area, where most people are there for a while, and so they get to know each other more easily. You might consider, if you are going to be staying in a campground, asking the camp host. They know everything. Just say, hey, you know, is there anybody around here that gets together for a potluck? Or do you know anybody around here that likes to play cards? Believe me, camp hosts know everything about everybody. And then, if you're going to be maybe in an RV park, part of the year. A lot of those RV parks have social agendas. I do know people that have gone to an RV park for a month to establish residency, another way to establish residency, and they've made friends there that they've traveled with afterwards. I don't know, four months in, if you are like a lot of us, you may have been go, go, going your first few months because it's so exciting. Once you stay in one place for a little bit longer, it is easier to meet people. And I'll tell you what, the two ladies that I met that had the best Wi-Fi system, I met them at the dump station at a rest area. And my friend Carol from the video, Carol and Robin Go to Mexico, I met at a Cracker Barrel parking lot. You know, there's a lot of very friendly people out there. You just have to get out there and say hello or try one of those groups. I love that I get to spend my Sundays with you, bird watchers. So if you have a question for me, please do put it in the comments down below and I'll answer it in two weeks. Coming up, I'm going to be showing you guys me trying to get out of Colorado in a blizzard, my driving lessons and all kinds of other new stuff that's coming your way. I hope to see you out on the road soon or I hope that you're just enjoying your Sunday and your life. Until then, everybody have happy travels and be free.